I'm going to walk around, I think. Okay. Sorry. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. Hello. That's very bright, so I might stand here if you don't mind. So, good evening. How's everyone? Good, good. Okay, excellent. So I'll try to do this upside down. Um, so before I start, who heard about this paradigm? Fresh body, fit mind. He did. Anyone else? Okay, so it's good because what we're going to do now is an exercise. So in light of this, please stand up. You see, that's... I know you didn't get pizza, but you know, we're making healthier, healthier decisions. So... The exercise is going to be very simple, okay? All you need to do, I'm going to show you my back. You need to raise up your arms, both of them, so that your elbow is in line with your eyes. Like, like that. Okay? And now, put your palms together. Repeatedly. Come on, come on, clap, 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 clap. Okay. <clears throat> For those of you still thinking what's going on. Thank you. Even with a very small crowd, this works very well. <laughs> Last time I did it, it was, um, it was a conference in India. I had 600 people doing that. That was like, whew. And then all of them were like, well, well ah. I was like, <laughs> Okay, so on a more serious note. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is image management, image performance, and image optimization. Okay, so that's going to be the topic for discussion. And I'm going to share, I think I have three statistics with you. The first one, and I highly recommend, probably you can't really read that, but I highly recommend that you take a look at that resource, which is the Web Almanac Project. Who has heard about the Web Almanac Project before? Good, okay, learning moment number one. <clears throat> so the Web Almanac Report is essentially a yearly report that is written by essentially you know, open source contributors, volunteers, etc., and it's based on the HTTP archive data set. So all the data that Google collects, if you opted in into that data collection, of course, um, all of that is then basically crunched by all these individuals, and there are individual chapters for the Web Almanacs. It's a very, very big report. It has chapters on media, uh, it has chapters on HTTP, JavaScript, CSS, accessibility, Jamstack, and it has like, I think, 20 plus chapters focusing on very specific topics. And so this statistic comes from the, the media chapter. Um, and by the way, anyone can uh, decide to write a chapter. So you can be either a, a contributor, as in an author, a reviewer, or a data analyst. Okay, so I just recommend that you check this uh, project out. So this comes from the, the media chapter from 2022, which is the, the latest one, essentially. So 99.9% .9 of all the websites out there today make a request to an image of some sort, which pretty much is telling us that, you know, every website makes a request to an image. So images are everywhere. And that's why it's really, really important to understand what image optimization can do and how that works. Here's another one. So I do work for a company called Cloudinary. So we have our own sort of media reports. Um, what we do is we basically allow anyone to store their media assets on our platform. So those are images and videos, and then you can transform them, optimize them, and deliver them. Okay. And this is from 2022 as well. So every month, the our so I call it image CDN. So that's Cloudinary processes 199 billion requests for images. Okay, and that's per month. Okay, so that's a lot of image data going through Cloudinary. And just so that we talk about diversity as well a little bit. So usually we think, you know, uh, mobile phones, we think, we think desktop, we think tablets. Cloudinary also sends 2.7 million images to Sony Bravia TVs. Okay, so maybe next time when you think about should I optimize for mobile and desktop, maybe add a Sony Bravia TV into that list as well. Um, and more important, this obviously the title of this talk is, you know, a picture is worth a thousand kilobytes, but you know the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. The reason why that saying exists, and here's some, you know, very clever person doing some research, it's a very long URL, but essentially 50% of our brain is, um, is capable of processing information from images, okay? So I can basically convey information to you a lot faster by using an image versus just showing you text, okay? And so it's really important to make sure that these images that you use in web applications arrive to, to the users in the right shape, in the right format, so that they can enjoy the website, the website is performant, etc., etc., etc. So I don't know how many of you know Andrea Vatica. 
Okay. Uh, again, highly recommend that you follow this person. Um, he is a, I think he works for web speed page, think speed something something. Huh? No, that's, that's not his actual name, by the way. It's just like a, a nickname, okay? Um, but that's how you will find him on LinkedIn, Twitter, everywhere, GitHub, etc. So he's, he does a lot of um, tweets around web performance. And in 2021, he said the following. The image element turned 25 in, uh, in 2020. It both engages users with delight and enrages developers. And I think it's a very nice way of putting how we work with images, right? The image element itself is very easy to use, but getting images right in your application can be very, very difficult. And so I looked up the HTML specification from 1995, and this is you know, the description of the image element. We're not going to go through this, but what I'm going to show you is that in 1995, the image element has these four attributes, right? Align, um, alt, ismap, and source. And of course, you know, the SRC or the source attribute is where you put in your image URL that you want to display on the site. So this is great. This is you know, 23 years ago, or no, 20 whatever years ago. And this is 2020 to 2023. This is how the image element could look like, right? This is a lot more complex. There's a lot of stuff in here and all of these were added for a reason, okay? So this, this could be a valid image element. There's a source, alt, uh, alt, width, height, source set, sizes, loading, decoding, style, etc., 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 etc. Okay, so we're going to talk about what these options mean and why you should be uh, considering using them. So, adding images to a website is easy. Is it? Yes? No? Yep. Is it? Okay, I'll prove you wrong. <laughs> adding it is easy. Adding it in the right way, right format, etc., can be very, very tricky because there's a lot of things that you need to understand so that your, your website performs well. Because here's the thing. Often when we talk about web performance, we think JavaScript, right? Oh, I'm going to lazy load my components and do this. We always focus on JavaScript. JavaScript is not the largest resource in, in a web application. It's images and videos, right? Even, even if you have a very complex and large web application, which is, I don't know, two megabytes of JavaScript, if you have 10, 500 kilobyte images, that's far going to be, or is going to be by far larger than the JavaScript, okay? And then not loading those correctly, um, not serving up in the, not serving up, not serving them up in the right format is all going to cause various issues for you. Okay, so that's why adding images is easy, but adding them or optimizing them in the right way is very, very difficult, or can be difficult. So these are the things that you need to think about, right? What image format should I use? Based on the image format, you need to also consider the actual content of the image, right? Because it doesn't really you can't apply the same optimizations and same transformations for a highly complex image versus just a simple image of a t-shirt, for example, okay? Because you get color bleeds, you get all sorts of visual artifacts and defects in your images, which you don't want to have. What are the devices that you're targeting? Maybe you say, okay, I'm just going to generate WebP. WebP is not supported in all the versions of Safari. So by default, you may sort of exclude a large portion of your users. Do you want to do responsive images? How do you want to deliver those images? How do you want those images to be decoded by the browser? So these are all questions that you need to think about. So the good news is that there are a lot of tools available. Okay, so there's an online tool, which it also, so I should have put that in the uh, libraries category as well. So Scooge.app is one um, tool that you can use to sort of optimize your images and it also has now has a CLI so it's installable by npm you can use a desktop client like image optim to you know pull in all your jpeg files and say oh reduce the the quality of these image files to you know quality 75 or something um, sharp gym those are all npm packages that you can use to programmatically do image optimization and of course you can use image cdns as well um, to to do this job now, so what are the key concepts? We're going to talk about some of these, but um, um, not, not all of these. So what you need to understand is the differences between image formats, okay? How is a JPEG different from a PNG, and how is it different from a WebP, and how is it different from an AVIF or a GIF, okay? That's, you need to understand that. You need to also understand user devices. What is our direction? What is device pixel ratio? What is a viewport? 
you then need to understand how your images affect your core web vitals, the largest content footprint, the first input delay, the cumulative layout shift. What happens when you have a responsive design? How do you create responsive images? And what techniques you have for loading images or loading image placeholders? So we're going to talk about some of these. Um, this is a, I think we call it a battle, yeah, battle card of Codex. Um, at Cloudinary, we created this, you know, this battle card, which basically shows the various image formats that are out there today that are actively being used on the web. JPEG Excel support has been removed from Chrome, so this JPEG Excel can only be used in very small, uh, very particular browsers, but not in the main ones. But you can see that, you know, just looking at this, you can see that you know, JPEG has been around since 1992, WebP 2010, uh, AVIF 2019, and obviously this is just a screenshot from the battle card. It's a, it's a very large one-page PDF document, but there are a lot of things that you can compare when it comes to the image formats. You know, fidelity, for example, uh, compression, how fast you know, would an AVIF be, be encoded and decoded versus, say, a JPEG. Okay, and FYI, encoding and decoding an AVIF takes a long time if the image is very, very large. Okay, so in fact, some image uh, CDNs like Cloudinary, we actually, um, if the image is too large, so it's, I think if it's either more than 4,000 or 6,000 pixels, we will not generate AVIF because it would take a long time or a, or a longer time that it's already not acceptable for any application to use it. <clears throat> Um, then I also had a look at the, um, uh, again, the Web Almanac project, just to see a breakdown of the image formats on the web. So by far, JPEG is the most widely used one, obviously because it is understood by all the browsers. Then it's PNG, uh, GIF, WebP, SVG, icons. And you see, AVI didn't even make the... Well, it's, it's in there, but you, you, we couldn't draw a label to it because it's such a small portion of this pie, okay? Now, I'm going to say this. Don't use GIFs. Just don't, okay, on websites. Just please don't. Uh, and I, why? It's very big. It's very inefficient. And you can do the same if you convert a GIF file into an MP4 or to a WebM file, and the end result is going to be a lot more performant. And if you use the video element with the autoplay, loop muted attributes, you, it will look like a GIF. And, and if you compare this, uh, I did this comparison. So I had a GIF which was eight seconds long and it was like an animation from a sports game. It was 18 megabytes. The same video was 800 kilobytes. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, on the battle codec, we saw something about fidelity. So fidelity is a very important concept to understand when it comes to image optimization. So fidelity is about Trying to, trying to preserve the details of the original image as, as closely as possible, okay? What do I mean by that? So I have an example where we have one image which is a low fidelity AVIF, and then we have a high fidelity JPEG. So maybe think of this JPEG as the original one. I don't know how well this is going to be visible, but the low fidelity means that in the low fidelity version of the AVIF, you lose the fine details of the wall. I don't know if that comes through over the, uh, the projector, but you see here, you can sort of see the bricks, whereas there you see a smooth red wall, okay? Now, yes, the AVIF would load in, let's say, in one second, and this would load in two seconds. You have achieved something that loads a lot faster, but is that good enough for you? Is, are you okay to lose the details of the optimized image? So that's why I mean that you have to understand that you know, generating a low fidelity AVIF may lose some of the details um, from the image. So here's another example, not related to the web, but just if you're curious, look up this thing called the Xerox incident. So what happened, this is from, I can't remember, Austria, Germany or Switzerland, um, where a company was scanning in all their, you know, their financial documents and stuff. Um, and in the Xerox uh, scanner back in the day, there was an image encoder, okay, that did all this work and it was a low fidelity image encoder. I, I'm forgetting the, the name of it. So can you see, so that's the original. This is what the scanner then output. Do you see what's wrong? Three. Three. 
Okay? Yeah, three and, and, and one. Okay? So that's what you, you have. This is what you scan and then send to someone. You either made or lost money or something happened. Something's off already. Okay? So there's actually a law in, in I think it's in, I don't know if it's in the dark countries, so uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, or Europe-wide, but the, there are certain image codecs and image encoders that they cannot use in scanners because of this incident that happened I don't know how many years ago, okay? So, <clears throat> so what does this all mean to us, the web developers, okay? So I have an example, which is, you know, totally made up, um, <laughs> totally legit business <laughs> called Bex for Sale. Okay, so let's say you're the developer and you know that you have to optimize your images because your boss wants the site to be really fast. He wants, you know, everyone to be able to see the products in one second. And then, you know, that's, of course, that, of course, is going to lead to, um, you know, a great experience for the users and, of course, better sales and better profit, right? Everyone is going, is going to be a snappy website. People will buy stuff. Great. And you, in order to do that, you create low fidelity images, right? So you create these smaller AVIFs that load faster. The problem is that because of the low fidelity um, property of the image, you're going to, you won't be able to preserve the original color. And depending on the business, you won't be able to preserve the, the sort of the fabric, the fine details of the fabric, which could essentially mean that you shoot yourself in the foot that, you know, you're going to have some unhappy customers who are going to get the product and they say, well, this looked black and now it's green, or this looked green and now it, it's actually black, right? So they're going to send the products back. Now I have a video which never works on a... They load a, yeah, 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 that, that's one. But what I'm focusing on is you, you don't know that you're supposed to do that because you just say, okay, AVIF, and I, I maybe load a higher quality version of the AVIF, but still low fidelity, right? It's still going to be different. So the video never works on a projector, I'm sorry. But what is supposed to happen? This bag has some very fine detail on the fabric and it's black. And then I'm going to start a video, but it is never visible. On the low fidelity version of the AVIF, the color changes to this very dark green and it loses the texture of the bag. It's almost like a smooth leather bag, which is, it's not. And then, I don't know if there's a way to distribute the slides. Then you, you will see it on your machine because it's more visible. It's going to like flicker between the two colors and you will see that on, when it's green, it's kind of smoother and the original has these little lines in the material, okay? So, Another very important um, topic, especially in the past, you know, six to 12 months is core web vitals. Anyone heard about core web vitals? A couple of you. Okay, so what are core web vitals? Core web vitals are um, essentially are three metrics, okay, that were introduced by Google that allow any website or any developer to adhere or to, to create a website that, that provides good user experience. And Google categorizes good user experience into three categories, right? One is responsiveness, one is uh, sort of like readability, although they called it stability, I think they called it. And the third one was loading time or something related to that. I can't remember the exact things that they did, but what they've done, they created three metrics, okay? Largest uh, contentful paint, first input delay and cumulative layout shift. And when they first announced this, they announced it three, four, like, you know, many, many years ago. And everyone was like, okay, metrics, pff, whatever. And then a couple of months, years later, Google said something that shocked everyone. And they said, okay, if you, scroll, if you score bad in any of these categories, that is now going to directly impact your uh, search page ranking. And that's when everyone was like, oh, wait, what, Core, core Web, what? What? Like, how? And so I'm not going to get into this because the talk is not about, you know, the Core Web Vitals and, and what they do. But essentially, if you have a bet, so each of these would have like a, a good and acceptable and a wrong or incorrect uh, metric. So first input delay, I think, is 0 to 100 milliseconds is good, 100 to 300 is the acceptable and 300 milliseconds and above is, is, is not good. So if you're in that 300 milliseconds plus category, that is going to impact your search page ranking. 
other than the usual, you know, whether you use HTTPS, um, how relevant your content is to the search, how fresh the content is, so on and so forth. So that's when people start to listen. So images also play a very critical part in core web vitals, right? So first input delay, um, if, so first input delay is about you trying to, you're trying to do an action on the, on the website. So a classic example is, you know, you go to a website, either on your mobile or on your, on your laptop, there's a search box, you click it, you type something, nothing happens, two seconds later, your text appears. That's a bad experience. It means that there is something, some sort of JavaScript running in the, in the background, which means that the browser can't process your input. Okay, so in that case, you're going to get a very bad score. But the thing is, if you have very large network requests, i.e. very large images that you send through, then you may be blocking your JavaScript to be downloaded, you may be blocking something that would increase your first input delay. Okay, this is not very typical, but it could happen. Okay, so if your image, if you have, I don't know, a two megabyte image, and that is going to be downloaded by the browser before the JavaScript that is responsible for some sort of event handler, you would be pressing you know, your the button, nothing is going to happen. So just be mindful of this. Uh, cumulative layout shift, again, very simple to sort of understand. Um, a typical example, you, you, you know, you're on your phone, you read an article, and then in between the paragraphs or in between the sentences, an advert just poof, comes in, and then it shifts the content. Very annoying, right? Cumulative layout shift is penalizing that. Cumulative layout shift means, or it measures how much the content shifts on the page. And that's why when you work with images, you are required to set the width and the height so that the browser knows how much space it needs to block out on the page so that the content does not shift, okay? And then you can also use aspect ratio with CSS to block the space for the images. And there are some other strategies in here. But the most important one and the most difficult one to solve, apparently, according to Google, um, is the largest content full paint, okay? Or the LCP. So LCP, very simply, measures how long the largest element on a given page took to load. And in modern sort of UX design, usually the largest element is an image of some sort, right? It's going to be a hero image or, 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 or an image, right? It's never going to be text, although they also measure text. And the, the thing is that largest content for paint and the metric for it, and, and I'm forgetting the, I think it's zero to 2.5 seconds is good, 2.5 to four or five is K, that's the orange, and then five seconds or four seconds and above, you're in the red zone, you need to definitely fix it. But that number, that calculation, is actually made up of these four sub-optimizations. So in order for you to optimize your LCP metric, you need to optimize four individual things. Time to first byte, resource load delay, resource load time, and uh, trying to reduce your element render delay. Okay, so optimizing any of these would yield a better largest contentful paint score or a better overall score for LCP. So I'm just very quickly going to go through this. How much time? Five minutes, okay. We started at half past. No, when? I'm okay? Okay, tell me when you're bored. Anyone has any plans before 10? I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so uh, reducing time to first byte. So what is time to first byte? You hit you go to the browser, you type in example.com, you send the request to the server, index.html comes back, and when the very first byte is received by the browser, that's the time that we measure. And your goal is to load the, the initial HTML page as soon as possible. And this is where there's a very important discussion, which I'm just going to focus on this last point, which is uh, generating sort of, you know, static, rendering of your HTML versus server-side rendering. There's a lot of discussion these days about server-side rendering, right? Server-side render in React and server-side render this. Server-side rendering is actually not good for your time to first byte, okay? Why? You send the request to a server, the server is then going to now server render something, so this, you know, is doing something and then it's going to send the HTML back. Whereas if you pre-build your HTML at build time, it means that when you go to a site, you request the HTML, it's there. It's just the server just needs to send it back or the CDN just needs to send it back, okay? So it's going to be a lot faster. There are other th tricks and tips in here. I'll let you um, 
look up those if you want to. So that's number one, so reduce time to first byte. Resource load delay. So resource load delay is a delta between the time to first byte and the browser starting to load what your LCP candidate is. In other words, your goal is to try to load, let's say the, the LCP is an image, your goal is to try to load the image asset as soon as possible, okay? Ideally, right after when the browser has received the HTML. Like the, the LCP candidate should be probably the second or the third resource that you load on the page, okay? Um, do, do you know what a preload scanner is? Browser preload scanner? Okay, so how do browsers work? Come on. <laughs> Yes, so, so what the browser does, right? The browser opens up an HTML page and is going to parse it line by line, okay? So if the LCP image is in line 30, it needs to parse 29 lines before it gets to that and starts to download that. So if there's a JavaScript, there's a CSS before it, that's when you get the network diagram in your Chrome DevTools, right? It will load the HTML, the, the, the scripts, the CSS, and then your image. That's already too late. You want that image to be loaded at an earlier point in time. And so what you can do in HTML, um, you can help what is called the, the preload scanner. So what is the role of the preload scanner? So if every website today would work how we just explained it, the web would be really, really slow. So every modern browser, in fact, this was first done in IE, like a very old version of IE. So this is actually Microsoft's doing, which is very good. Um, so the preload scanner, pre-scan, so there's a separate process in the browser that pre-scans your document, and it's going to look up things like JavaScript files, CSS files, images, and it's going to assign priorities to those based on what it thinks the importance of these assets are, okay? And that's why if you op ever open up DevTools and you go to the network requests and you have a column called priority, you will see highest, high, medium, low, lowest, okay? That is done by the preload scanner, but most of the time it's okay, but sometimes you know, the browser doesn't know that that image is really important for you, so you need to help it. So the way you do that is not on my slides. Um, you need to research, no. Uh, the way you do that, so there's a, I wonder why it's not on my slides though. There is um, a fetch, so there's a link element, right? The one that you use to load style sheets, et cetera. So if you say link with the fetch, priority attribute and you set it to high and you give it the href of your image, the browser will download that asset. It's going to be the second thing that it downloads, okay? Because it will say, okay, that is very important. I need to download it as soon as possible. Um, okay, so it will start, it will find the image, it will start downloading the image, and now we go to the third optimizer or the sub-optimization, which is resource load time, which is very simply put, the amount of time it takes for the resource to arrive, okay? And this is when, again, image optimization plays a very important role because the smaller the image size is, the faster it's going to arrive, you know, uh, the, the faster we can transfer it over the network. Um, one, I always forget, it's, I always says side note, it's side note, okay? <laughs> it's not side note. Um, so it's very important to understand that, you know, sometimes, so LCP is, you know, if you don't have any images on the page, you will still get an LCP score because LCP also measures text. And this is very important to understand that if you have custom fonts, third-party fonts that you load and you apply using CSS, the time that you get the font, you apply it, etc., will impact your LCP, okay? So if your LCP is text, then make sure that you load your fonts in the most efficient manner as possible. But we're going to now focus on images. Um, so essentially, you want to send a, a, an optimized resource through the network, okay? That's, that's your, your ultimate goal. Um, so there was a, a point about loading images via an image CDN on the previous slide, and there was an asterisk, so this is the explanation for that. So usually, serving an image from, a, from, the, same, from the same origin it's going to be faster, right? So if you have example.com slash index.html and your image is example.com slash hero.jpg, that's going to work faster. 
compare it to if you have that image on an image CDN because then there's a separate network lookup, network request, DNS lookup, etc. So you have to go, the browser has to go somewhere. But on the flip side, image CDNs come with a lot of features, okay? Apart from optimization and transformations. And so you need to wait whether the benefit of using that CDN with the extra features is actually better than serving the images locally. Now that's up to you to, to sort of decide what, what you want to do, but um, if there's time, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, so image has now arrived. Last and fourth um, element render delay, which is the last sub-optimization. So that's the time when you have received the resource and the browser rendering that resource or the, or the browser's capability to be able to render that resource on the screen, okay? Your goal is to reduce that time. So the browser has it, you want to display it as soon as possible. And this is where we need to talk about my second favorite thing, which is lazy loading, okay? Because everyone, in the same way how we talk about server-side rendering these days, a lot of people talk about lazy loading. And usually the mantra is, lazy load your images. Yes, but if you lazy load your LCP hero image, you're again doing the right? You're shooting yourself in the foot because you have now artificially extended your LCP time because you're telling the browser, yeah, yeah, that image can wait, you know, you can render it whenever. Don't. Don't ever, ever. If the only thing that you remember is never, ever lazy load an image that is considered to be an LCP image, okay? Because th this is going to be loaded whenever the browser thinks it's ready to load it. You want to load it as soon as possible, okay? I've seen a... I've seen a website the other day, I can't remember what the website was. Every single image on the site had the loading lazy attribute on it. I checked the site, the LCP was an image element and it had a terrible score, exactly for that, right? You don't want to lazy load that. Um, yeah, yeah there, there are lots of places where you can do that. Lighthouse is a good start, but there's a better way to do that. If, again, if there's time, I'll, if I'm given time, then I'll show you how to do that. Okay, um, I'll show you this example, because that's what uh, I have, that doesn't matter. Um, image optimization checklist. Um, so this is, yeah, this is related to that. So Lighthouse is built into your DevTools, very good start. It can, you know, show you some performance scores, some, you know, it can show you some warnings, some errors, some optimization stuff. You can actually also check what the LCP uh, candidate is, et cetera, et cetera. That's a good start, okay? You do that once, it's going to unveil some issues for your site, but then that's it. Because otherwise, the metrics that you get from Lighthouse are meaningless. Why? There is the PageSpeed Insights. So the difference, so PageSpeed Insights, if you, it's, it's free to use, it's by Google, you enter a URL, you're going to get a report that looks exactly like Lighthouse. But there's going to be a section on top, which is going to be called RUM section, Real User Metrics. And what uh, PageSpeed Insights does is going to measure how your users, your real users, um, or how the experience was for your real users for the past 28 days. And that is the metric that you should look at. You should always try to look at real user metrics because if I run a Lighthouse report on this machine and on that one and on that one, we're going to get three different results, three different scores, different milliseconds, different this. Why? Because it's local to the machine. It's different network settings, different CPU, different memory, different everything. PageSpeed Insights collects data from me, from you, from everyone, and it's going to present that data. And so if I see that, okay, the LCP in the past 28 days was in the, in the red zone, I have a problem. The real users visiting my site have a very good experience. Now I can go back to Lighthouse and try to figure out why that is, optimize it, but that should be the data that you go to. Uh, that should be the data that you use. And other things like um, there's web page tests, there's um, Yellow Labs, there's Debug Bear, there, there are lots of you know, performance measurement tools and most of them also have this real user metric data, okay? Which is very, very important. Um, 
there's a, I don't know how many of you've seen it, but in DevTools, um, in Chrome, as of version 100 and X, there is a, an experimental panel called Performance Insights. So that is the sort of new version. So, so Chrome is going to remove, I think, the performance or the whatever panel soon, and this one is going to replace it. It gives you a much better overview of the performance of your site. Um, in fact, for, for the LCP, it will actually show you the four subcalculations that I just mentioned. It's going to kind of draw it out on a uh, on a bar chart and say, okay, this is time to first buy. This is the element render delay, etc. So I highly recommend that you check that out. Um, then, um, yes, optimizing images. So bulk optimization is is when you have 100 JPEG files, you put it into an optimization tool, and you say, give me quality 70 five of these JPEGs. That's a good start. It's going to give you, you know, smaller images. But that's not good enough. Why? Because there are images that could do with less or more optimization. Okay, there could be, you know, uh, one image could be reduced by 40%, the other one could be 10%, the other one could be 90%, right? The image optimization tools will not analyze the image. Image CDNs, on the other hand, would analyze the image, and it would make the optimizations based on the content of the image. Um, different versions for different browsers. Again, if you were to do this on your own, you would have to figure out a way to see, okay, does this browser support WebP? Yes, it does. Send the WebP. Does it support AVIF? Maybe send the AVIF. Does it not, do, does it not support any of that? Well, send the JPEG. Do it if you want to. I, I wouldn't, <laughs> but because it's it's very you know it's a cumbersome thing to do. Uh, image CDNs do that automatically again. Uh, lazy load images, but not LCP. And uh, if you want to show something to users really really quickly, there's a technique called LQIP, which is low quality image placeholders, which you can use. So a couple of examples. That's the performance insights panel, by the way. I think yes. So you you run this, and then you will get this. Sorry, this is the Performance Insights panel. That's Lighthouse, I think. Um, you probably can't read this, but you know th this is the LCP breakdown. Time to first byte, resource load delay, resource load time, element render delay. You look at this, and you're like, okay, I need to look into that, because that takes a lot of time. Right? That's, that's six seconds out of the total of seven seconds that it took to load the LCP image, or the LCP candidate. Okay, so this, this is from... Um, Chrome DevTools Performance Insights. Yikes, okay, I don't know why I have that there. Uh, can you do all of this at once? Yes, you can. So, um, oh, there's so much I want to say. <laughs> okay, let's focus on just this part, okay, the style attribute. So what you see here, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of examples in just a second, but what you see here is a what I call the low quality image placeholder. So what we do here, just, just focus on the source and the style elements. So the way this works is that because you have a heavily optimized SVG, so this file is about, I think, 2.3 kilobytes in my example, I just create a two color vector SVG of the original image and I add it using the, CS, um, uh, the style attribute, which means this will load really, really fast, okay? And then when the browser has finished loading the original image, which is on top, right, the, the SRC attribute, that's going to be replaced with this, okay? So what you achieve with this is that you're going to show something for users, which is kind of a visual representation, a very simplified visual representation of what they're going to see, and then when the browser processes and downloads the file, boom, it's just going to replace it. So that's the whole idea behind um, low quality image placeholders. And there are various ways that you can load these images uh, in there. Um, yes, and sorry, the loading lazy, so that's, that's the attribute. Uh, loading is equal to lazy. The default behavior is loading equal to eager. So that's the default behavior of the browser. Uh, if you add that, then you apply lazy loading to the images, and you know you can now do that in just HTML. There's no need to install a third-party dependency and do some some crazy magic. Um, okay, I'll I'll explain this in a second. I think this is a video. Yeah, so this is a video recording of what's going to happen. So that's the original, but when we refresh the page, we're going to get 
the 2.8 kilobyte SVG, right? So you see something is going to load there. So let me play this. Oh, it keeps on playing, right? Okay, so you all saw what happened. It, it won't loop because I think I recorded it twice. Let's just go there. Okay, so that's the SVG, and then obviously that's 2.8 kilobytes versus 181. Uh, okay. So yeah, here, um, there's just one point that I wanted to make. So picture element, in the picture element, you can use multiple source elements with a fallback of an image element. Um, this is useful if you don't want to use an image CD and then you have created an AVIF, a WebP, and a JPEG of the same image. Using this, thinking about the browser again, the line-by-line -line code execution, if you open this HTML page in a browser that supports AVIF, then it will load the AVIF file and ignore everything else. If it doesn't know what that is, it's going to check the next line. WebP, do I understand it? It will display it, if, and if it doesn't, you just fall back to the image element, okay? Which also means that the order of the source items does matter, okay? Um, I, I don't have that slide, but when, I think it was last year in 2021, when we analyzed the, using Web Almanac data, we analyzed the source elements for the video the order was MP4 and WebM. That was the most used combination. So the intent is good because developers generated a WebM and an MP4. The WebM is web movies, like, you know, it's like a, the animated or the video version of WebP. It's a lot, the compression is a lot better, okay? So if, if an MP4 file is, say, a megabyte, the WebM would be 800 or 700 kilobytes. So that's good. But if you put MP4 before WebM in the source, what happens? Browsers were just daily the MP4. They would never actually get to the WebM. And this was the most used combination in 2021 or 2022. It should be the other way around. The other point that I want to make is that if you have this set up uh, and if you uh, have the, you know, the loading and the decoding um, attributes added to your image source, loading and decoding cannot be added to the source element. However, loading, lazy, and decoding would be inherited by the source elements. So even though I added loading, lazy to the image element, the AVIF and the WebP, whichever gets loaded, will also be loaded lazily by the browser, okay? Oh, my favorite. This is the sort of pro tip, okay? So going back to, which way is back? Is this way back? Okay, so going back to this example here, you see the source set. So this is, I have my colleague here. I spent like half a day looking at this and I went crazy. So the source set means, so look at the source set and look at the sizes. So what I'm saying is that if the browser is 600 pixels or less, I want to load the W400 image, which is a 400 pixel image. If it's above, I want to load W800, which is 800. Meaning that, you know, if, if you, this is responsive, design slash responsive images, right? As you make the browser window larger, I just load a larger image. And so <laughs> I loaded this and no matter what I did, I always got the W800 loaded every single time. And I was like, I, I, I don't know, you, you know, in, in DevTools, there's a way to, to see the, the width of the browser in pixels and it was, it was 600 and less, and it, it didn't change anything. It always loaded W800. It always loaded the width 800. And I thought, so do, do you know why this is? Yeah, the fucking... Huh? It's the max width. Is it what? The max width. No. It's, it's what he said. I'll, I'll show you. So in... I'm going the wrong way, right? Yeah. So in DevTools... So here's the thing, in DevTools, if you have DevTools open like that, you would never notice those three dots. But when you click that, it will show you a setting that says add or display the device pixel ratio, which turns out to default to 2.0. What does that mean? It means that because I'm using a retina screen, device pixel ratio means that the browser will try to load twice as many pixels into the same space i.e. not 400, but 400 times 2, which is 800. So thank you, Google DevTools. 
Okay, that's the default, and it's very hidden. So all I had to do was change that to 1.0, and then 400, 800, everything just worked. Okay, very annoying. Huh? It's anything that's is so anything that's um, yeah, but but it's not only Retina display. It's anything. It's just you know Retina display is a Apple you know trademark name for this. But any laptop, tablet, mobile phone that is. Yeah, I don't know how other companies call it, but it would apply to most modern uh, devices. But on those devices, you do actually want to load a larger image. You do, yeah. But when you test that, you're, that should be pointed out to me in my face that, hey, by the way, we default to DPR2. Because when you open that scroll down, it will actually say 2.0 brackets default. And I'm like, thank you. And finding that took me a long time. OK, well, oh, that's the example. I don't know why this moved here. So that's the fresh priority that I mentioned, right? Fresh priority high, preload that image as image. OK, and this will tell the browser to load the image as soon as possible. But I'm going to show you a demo real quick. Um, OK, let's, let's actually do this. I'm going to take this here. And I uh, need to find the demo, which was deployed to Netlify. I should have opened this. I do apologize. Uh, Serene Genie is the one that we're looking for. And I'm going to open this in Chrome DevTools. OK. DevTools. OK. so. Let me just pop this back in here. So what you see here is what I call the baseline. Okay, so there's obviously you know the image gallery and blah blah blah. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so the baseline is going to be really really slow. Okay, you can see it's it's really slow, and then when all together is done, that's even slower, but that should be faster. <laughs> so I don't know why that is, uh, but let's do the trick of throttling. Can you actually see that? Sorry. So let's throttle down the network to fast 3G and try to open the home page. And this is when the problem starts, OK? And, 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 and look at these, OK? That's um, the problem, because we're loading images that are megabytes and megabytes in size, which is not something you want to do, OK? And if I go to the altogether site, again, we're on a 3G connection. It's done. OK, because the images are a fraction of the original sizes. So there are a couple of things in here. And I'm, I would be more than happy to, do I have more time? Or are you bored of me already? Wrap up soon. Wrap up soon. OK. So I, I'll try to share this with you as well. But basically, it goes from the, the baseline to the all together by using the different optimization steps. Right? One is the time to first byte. One is the, so all these four sub-optimizations that I mentioned, each of those menu items would go through that. And there's also like a, a lazy loading example just to show you how the LCP is affected by you adding lazy loading. Um, OK, two things I'll show you. One is how do you see what the LCP is. So all you need to do is go to performance. And here's another pro tip for you. If you do any tests, like a lighthouse test or a performance test with the DevTools docked like this, the view, your viewport is literally from here to there. That's what you're going to measure. OK, so if you want a real measurement, you dog this out because now it's going to look at that whole page as a viewport. OK, very, very important. Uh, you do performance measurement and then under timings. You see, there's a, again, let me just zoom in a little bit. Under timings, there's going to be a couple of labels, and one of them is going to be LCP. That's how you find your LCP time. And then if you click on it, you're going to then also see which element is considered for the LCP calculation on, on the page. And then if you click this, you're going to be taken to the source code, and then you can see that, hey, this was the image. Obviously, that was the largest thing, right? So it's, we could have figured this out, but that's the largest thing that we have there. Okay? No. 
well, you can you can make the image smaller and the text lo like you you can, but you can't tell Google that hey, measure that instead. It's it's always automatic. It will it will look at the page and it will say, okay, that's the largest element. That's what we're going to calculate. Okay, so you can of course make this smaller and make this text bigger. Then it may change, but it's always done by by Google. Okay. Um, so how was this optimization achieved? So let me just take this uh, copy. Can I click this? Yes, OK. So let me just show you this real quick. Do you mind if I, if I sit down? So it's just going to be easy. image, right? That's what we started from. And then if you go to the network panel, this image is 12.4 megabytes. Um, and it is a JPEG. Okay. So what I've done, I took this image and I uploaded it to the ordinary and I gave it access to the zoom. Okay. So it looks like this. Okay. An image upload folder name file. I just called the file one. Now I'm One more thing. to load megabytes of images. Ha! <laughs> Welcome to unnamed, hopefully totally masked out, luxury Swiss watch company, real company, famous company. Each image in that uh, 
gallery is two plus megabytes. Okay, why? They shrink, they get a, a 1,250 pixel by 1,670 pixel image and shrink it down to 190 pixels. Okay, real problem. I was on a website, I was doing some research and I found a 17 megabyte PNG. I can't remember if it was a New Zealand or a South African e-commerce website. 37 megabytes for, and it was also a watch, an image of a watch, okay? So real problem, it's out there. I tried to load this website just to see that gallery, even on like a full-blown Wi-Fi, it took me at least, you know, 15, 20 seconds. And then imagine clicking into that, seeing six, seven images of that watch. Like who would buy from this? Like they are, like they are well-known, okay? This is a real well-known uh, brand. Okay, a couple of resources. You can, you know, check these when you get the slides. And that's all. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Uh, I'll defer that to... No problem. Thank you for listening again. Uh, if there's, you. if you have any questions, uh, that's my website slash portfolio. From there, there are links to social, uh, LinkedIn, whatever. You know, feel free to to get in touch. I'll be happy to talk to you about image and video performance. Thank you. And you want to connect back? Um, well, oh, but you need. Um, Good to ask questions, so I'm going to... Oh, you ask a good question. Okay, sure. So, um, so why haven't we come up with a progressive image format whereby the front is the low-quality image and the browser could just request that and only request the rest? I think JPEG XL does that, right? Mm -hmm. So JPEG so JPEG XL is... And there's politics involved right now. Okay, so JPEG XL is slash was supposed to be the new JPEG, okay? It's, it's based on the JPEG standard. It has been worked on by the JPEG committee. One of my colleagues at Cloudinary is part of that committee. He's done a lot of work. They released it. It beat everything in every dimension. It beat AVIF, WebP, uh, low fidelity, high fidelity. It, it didn't matter. Compression speed, uncompressed, it doesn't matter. And now Google removed it from Chrome. Uh, Firefox removed it from Firefox. I don't know why. They claim that because it is a, um, what was that claim? Google, they just said, oh, it's like a, a well, okay. Google has and owns WebP, okay? I'll just leave it at that, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, so it exists. Uh, you, can, you can just look it up, jpeg-xl. Um, it does a lot of things that all images on the web should do but there's resistance from browser vendors for various political reasons that should not be discussed at this meetup. Oh, and Apple has, you know, the H-E-I-C, I don't know how to pronounce, hike, heek, whatever. Uh, there's, you know, there's lots of AVIF stuff happening. The problem with, i tell you what the problem is with these formats. So WebP, AVIF, and H-E-I, hike, heek, I don't know. Yeah, but how do you pronounce hike? You know, H E I C. Anyway, so these three image formats were derived from video codecs. And therein lies the problem. So, even though they are very efficient in encoding, if you have, so if you compare, and I have a demo, but <laughs> I don't want to bore you anymore. So, if you load the same image as JPEG and AVIF, the AVIF is going to load a lot faster, but you will see blank. And then boom, the full-blown version. Whereas with JPEG, you will see, if it's progressive JPEG, you will see a blurred version, then a clearer version, and then the final image. Okay? And that, that depends what you want, right? If, if, you, if you're happy with blank, boom, fine, use AVIF, but be aware of this limitation. And this limitation comes from the fact that they were derived from video codecs. Okay, so what happens is you upload the image, okay? Then we store it, 
and then let's say this is the first time you do any set of transformations. Then we do it within our server, and then that transformation is then pushed out to the CDN. So, which is, and we are uh, what is called a, um, uh, what do you call it, multi CDN vendor, whatever, multi, multi CDN. We work with Akamai, Fastly, Cloudflare, all of them. And then we, in, we, you don't know which one we use because we're going to use the most optimal one, multi vendor CDN, I think it's called, right? Anyway. And then we push it out to the CDN network. And so if, this, if you request the same set of transformations, like an F auto Q auto with 400, you never come back to us. We just serve it from the CDN closest to your location. And then we have options where, so you can do eager transformations where when you upload the image, you tell us these are the transformations I want to use. And when you upload the image, we do those transformations, we push that to the CDN. So by the time you request it, it's already on the CDN. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Why would some problems do the preference for you if you can make it faster? What do you mean? So I'm not sure if I so so browser compression for images. Yeah. But, but what image? Like, can you sorry clarify that a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't the browser optimize it? Yeah. yeah because yeah. So yeah. The, yeah yeah. So the browser needs to receive the image. Like it could do it, but it would still need to. So if it's a two megabyte image, it would still need to receive it via a network request, right? And it could optimize it, but then it's another set of seconds that you add to that delay because, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.